Hey, guess what? It took us 11 entries, but we finally reached a movie that I would actually consider good. That means roughly 40% of the entries are either mediocre or bad. That's unfortunate, but it's not like I didn't actually enjoy or admire any of the movies up to this point. Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind has its issues too, but I can actually confidently say that they are outweighed by the positives. Miyazaki and Takahata made movies before this, obviously, but this is their first one that was really financially successful as well as well received, despite being a very risk-taking venture. Originally, the idea for Nausicaa was rejected because at the time anime movies were only considered financially viable if they were based on pre-existing intellectual properties. So, Miyazaki literally made a Manga just to adapt it, the absolute mad lad. Without exploiting this loophole, we wouldn't have what is arguably the most influential anime film ever made. The soundtrack is great and incredibly similar to the type of music you'd hear in a Super Nintendo game, and the movie blends nature with steampunk technology in a way that was never seen prior. Hironobu Sakaguchi, the creator of Final Fantasy, cites the Nashka movie and manga as inspirations. You can definitely see it, since the worlds of Final Fantasy games are made up of a similar combination of old legends and modern technology. Let's not forget that without Final Fantasy, we practically wouldn't have the RPG genre, so we owe a whole lot to Nashka. It is a mix of anti-war and environmentalist sentiments. It's incredibly impressive how Miyazaki managed to translate these different themes and morph them into a coherent and believable universe. It's absolutely not an easy thing to do and not something we should take for granted. Miyazaki's love for European architecture and Western literature is a noticeable inspiration for many of his films, such as the previously discussed Howl's Moving Castle, but considering the environment of Nashka is much more complex and neatly woven, the design of the towns, the buildings, the technology, the creatures, the result is much more effective than in Hal. Instead of just being pleasing purely on an aesthetic level, it's now an element that brings me closer into these conflicts. Not just a quiet town, the film is filled with memorable environments, designs and set pieces. It's as dirty and scary as it is beautiful, which is fitting because it helps you get in the mind of Nashka. She loves not just one side of this conflict, she loves this entire world, which is why she wants the smallest number of casualties possible. And through the visual design of everything, you understand why. The plight of every person, every creature in this film is understandable. Nashka is a great heroine, brave and intelligent, yet somewhat flawed as well due to her difficulty controlling her emotions. You feel close to her on an emotional level as she tries to reason with people who have understandable motivations that you know as an audience member their actions will only result in suffering. I wish I could praise it even further. As much as I love so much about this movie, much of what I praise it for is also a strength of Princess Mononoke, which, through the process of elimination, you already know is higher on this list. The difference between this movie and Mononoke is that Mononoke got its message across in a much cleaner fashion. Nashka is bogged down by details which don't ruin anything per se, but simply aren't necessary. The conflict already has three sides, Nashka, the bugs of the toxic jungle, and the kingdom of Tolmet. Mechia. Tolmechia already represents the overly militarized and controlling side of humanity. Why do we also need to include Pejit, another human population which serves an incredibly similar role? It just ends up overcomplicating things. The theme of fate and prophecy is briefly touched upon, and that barely pays off. The bugs can inexplicably heal things, which only serves to be an incredibly unsatisfying element of the ending. Have you ever heard of Funny Games? It's a duo of movies, both made by the same director. One is a shot-for-shot -shot remake of the other, and I think the remake's better than the original, in pretty much every way. Despite this, I'd still be happy to watch the original, even if it has nothing over its remake, in my opinion. I can't say the same thing for Nashka Mononoke. While Nashka is definitely a good movie, it's not good enough to not become obsolete due to an incredibly similar, better movie in every way by the same director. It's a shame because it has its own great soundtrack, an interesting world, great animation, it's just obsolete because of the execution of the story. It's incredibly similar to another movie, just not as good. To wrap things up for this segment, I'd be damned if I didn't mention Warriors of the Wind. For some reason, when this movie was initially released in the West, it had 20 minutes cut out of it, it was renamed Warriors of the Wind, and the poster was this. Just thought I should bring this up.
While Castle in the Sky is similar in many ways to other adventure movies, it's far from an original. In fact, its originality is what makes it so enjoyable. However, discussing it is somewhat difficult since it's not even close to a complex, profound, or even completely unique experience, nor is it trying to be, and that's perfectly fine. You could say the same about other entries I discussed before, but they had serious flaws to talk about. Let's discuss the presentation, because just like Nashka, it's easily the most standout part. Once again, Miyazaki's love for nature blends with his fascination for technology, and especially aircraft. The bug-like aircraft is incredibly memorable, as is the design for the robots. These robots are eerie, strange, and uncanny, yet somehow very friendly looking. The soundtrack is fantastic, as is literally every soundtrack Joe Hisaishi composed for Ghibli. The animation is intricate and lively, while the main characters are pretty simple, and just kind of there to do their job, the side characters are awesome. Screw Sheeta! Dola is the real Ghibli heroine of this movie. She's like the cool grandma everyone wants to have. And I love how the pirates aren't just generic goons like stormtroopers. They have their own unique appearances and a fun personality. This is clearly Ghibli playing it safe since this was their first feature, and they needed to make sure they can make money before they start going in experimental directions. Still, Miyazaki likes to present worlds and ideas that will develop kids' imagination imaginations, and that pure intent is very easily noticed here. There is some small stupid stuff here, like the one line of dialogue meant to shoehorn in an environmental message because Miyazaki is Miyazaki, and apparently Pazu's father photographed the titular mysterious castle in the sky, but people still called him a fraud and doubted the existence of the castle? Does this universe have Photoshop or something? But it doesn't take away from one thing. It's fun. Kind of basic, but fun. There's never a dull moment, constantly building to this mysterious titular location, stakes are constantly raised. Remember the formula I mentioned in the Mary and the Witch's Flower segment? It's mostly prevalent in animated movies today, especially western ones, but older ones had a similar structure too. A lot of the qualifications of the formula are things that are found here, but without a pretense that there's some grand emotional depth to everything. It's an adventure that starts and just goes, never stopping, always involving you in the action. Combine that with Miyazaki's imagination, and you've got a film that isn't groundbreaking, yet still stands out on its own. I don't really know how to end the segment, uh, so... Uh... Only Yesterday is based on a manga, consisting of different episodes in the life of a 10-year-old girl in 1966. In every way, Poppy Hill was an unremarkable attempt to portray 1960s Japan as a wonderful nostalgic time, only yesterday nailed it. It was a brilliant decision to have the color palette be more washed out and have the image fade the closer to the edge you get. It not only reflects the way memories fade, it makes the film look that much closer to a child's drawing without sacrificing any of the beauty of the visuals. Each different flashback segment is incredibly entertaining. And instead of tackling general concepts through a story we've seen a million times before, each little short is super specific. Each of them could actually be a real story a real person has experienced because of how laser-focused they are. The stories are so personal that even someone who's never experienced something like them before can relate to them. Someone like me. They capture the innocent feeling of childhood perfectly, the immaturity and how emotions get in the way of our communication. When we look back at our childhood, we realize how we used to take certain things for granted, or didn't realize how different it would be from our adulthood, and that sense of reflection is executed phenomenally. Not just the good memories, but the bad ones too. This film is not afraid to show the really uncomfortable aspects of the past as well, and it does so very well with the voice acting, animation, sound design, etc. While we're on the subject of voice acting, I'd like to mention that with the exception of Mary and the Witch's Flower, every movie featured here I watched in Japanese. The voice acting is consistently great in each Ghibli movie. Since animation is viewed as an art form the same way live action is seen in the West, Good voice acting there is seen in the same light as good acting here. Every performance in every Ghibli movie is spot on, and Only Yesterday is a good example of this. Now back to Only Yesterday, where its flaws come from is that Isao Takahata didn't want it to be a collection of loosely connected short stories, so he introduced a present time side to the story, an adult version of the main character to reflect on these memories, a way to tie them all together. This is the part that's kinda bland in my opinion. There's still a lot to appreciate, like how Takahata took the animators on a trip to actually pick Safflower so they could capture it perfectly in the film. 
He always wanted to push the envelope in terms of animation, and he really wanted precision and realism in his works, which is partially why his movies are more grounded than his buddy's movies. It really comes across in the way this side of the film is animated. Even the weird cheeks, he wanted to animate more realistic facial animation. While to many people it's incredibly jarring, I think it's only kind of distracting at first and then I got used to it. However, I'd be lying if I said this side of the film wasn't somewhat dull in my eyes. For everything it does right, what it doesn't do is smoothly tie the flashback scenes together. Any attempt to connect the past to the present is there, yet almost non-existent. It's very flimsy. They wanted to make a connection, so when the flashback ends there's like a line of dialogue or monologue about it and that's it. Either that or the movie insists this part of the main character's childhood is somehow super important to her without really explaining why. One flashback segment ends with her getting a boyfriend. Whatever happened between them could have been used to connect the past and the present, but no, it's just kind of forgotten about. Plus, modern data Eiko, the main character, is way less interesting than her younger counterpart. Same with her love interest whose name I forgot, despite him being a main character. It makes any attempt for real emotional development not really pay off. Especially at the end. The charm the filmmakers probably wanted to be there just isn't. The movie was marketed towards older women, and it's one of those cases where if I was part of the target audience, I'd probably love it, but I'm not so I don't. But man, those flashback scenes are like, so good. They're the work of a real artistic genius in my eyes. Fun fact, for a long while I had no idea My Neighbors the Amadas was even a thing that existed. This to me seems like the least talked about movie Ghibli actually made. Perhaps it's because it's the only one to actually lose money. Grave of the Fireflies and My Neighbor Totoro originally didn't make much money when they first came out, but through a merchandising deal for Totoro, they eventually earned their money back. Too bad it isn't the same here. It's not like I can't see why it lost money. Not only is the art style very different from Ghibli's other works, meaning people can't automatically associate this with their beloved studio on first glance, this film is only yesterday, but only the flashback sequences. Meaning this movie, which is based off of a bunch of gag comics, is a large amount of loosely connected vignettes. This probably resulted in many people not being able to connect with it on an emotional level, so yeah, I'm guessing word of mouth wasn't on this movie's side. Oh, and also, Takahata is known for going over budget with his movies, so yeah, that also probably had something to do with it. Oh, and also, again, it was the first Ghibli movie to not use cell animation, instead entirely being done on computers. It couldn't have looked the way it does otherwise. The issue is that nobody at Ghibli knew how to manage digital animation, so it threw the entire fucking studio into chaos. For such a quaint and simple little movie, it sure is a destructive motherfucker. I'll admit that the first time I watched it, I had a hard time connecting with it because of its structure. I was bored out of my mind, but the change in mindset the second time around made me appreciate it a lot more. This isn't a film that's necessarily precise, it's not one that rewards incredible attention, where every watch you realize a completely new, intricate, deep dimension of the story, rather one that you put on to relax and have a good time by yourself. When approaching it with this idea in mind, I think you'll have a much better experience. I compare this to only yesterday's flashback segments, but they're not exactly the same tonally. The lighthearted flashbacks are just that, lighthearted, and not all of them are like that. My Neighbors the Amadas is explicitly comedic, it's based off of gag comics after all. The tone of the comedy is goofy, relatable, slice-of-life family comedy. Hearing gag comic coupled with these other words and phrases may give you an anxiety attack considering the reputation of those in the West. I don't know what they're like in Japan, but this isn't bitter or hateful. A scene where the Yamadas are way too distracted by their TV to hear what the father is saying easily could have ended up sounding like a bitter old man hating modern technology. Rather, instead of just the kids being distracted, it's literally everyone, and the punchline is the father is somewhat childish reason reaction rather than don't you hate modern technology too? The tone is actually the exact opposite from Boomer Comics. It embraces the flaws of humans and life and paints them in a charming light. This makes the movie actually funny. The characters are flawed, but that's what makes them human. That's literally the message of the film, and it's what makes it as fun as it is. There's even moments that are really wholesome and heartwarming. It has a love for life and its many idiosyncrasies that's incredibly contagious and even strangely profound. I will admit this though, even with a change in mindset I still found myself checking how much time I had left. The movie is mostly divided into very short vignettes, short like comics, so it's not like it has the ability to really develop 
develop ideas, themes, or even characters, it doesn't help that they are kind of similar too. The movie tries to make up for it by organizing them by theme, but it doesn't do much to remedy the situation. My favorite parts of the movie are the ones that are longer, ones that are about the length of a short TV episode because they have time to develop things and help you get really sucked in. It also uses two specific songs in its soundtrack way too much. Not variants, literally the exact same songs. This isn't a perfect movie by any means, it's not even as good as the flashbacks in Only Yesterday, if it was it would be much higher, but if My Neighbors the Amada has taught me anything, it's that being flawed doesn't mean you have no value. Hey, you know what? Fuck the wind rises. Porco Rosso is what a true love letter to early 20th century aviation is like. Don't want a piece of cardboard as your protagonist? Make him a neo-noir protagonist and also a pig. Porco actually has charisma and charm. He may be a lazy pig, very accurately reflected in his appearance, and also he's from the 40s so he's sexist, but he's so incredibly charming. He works off of the other characters perfectly. This is easily the funniest film Ghibli ever made. Every character, even minor ones, is super memorable and likable. Theo is incredibly energetic and spunky. Curtis sees himself as a charming ladies man, even though he's a big dum-dum. This movie has its own version of the pirates from Castle in the Sky, just this big group of dumb brutes. And many of them have unique designs to make them stand out. Even these little girls that just exist to be rescued by Porco at the beginning are such a fun addition to the movie. There's always something new happening, a new setting, new characters, or an interesting new conflict. And Porco's character is the somewhat grounded backbone that holds this madness together. I know that sounds weird, but it is true. The scene which I can only describe as plain heaven is strangely enough one of the most beautiful scenes I've ever seen in a movie. Parker also basically exists as a homage to films from the golden era of Hollywood. The lovable anti-hero main character, the beautiful elegant love interest, the spunky younger sidekick, the lawman that's friends with the anti-hero and lets him exist on this border between lawful and unlawful. Love and passion oozes out of every one of this film's orifices and I love it. You know a movie is special when even the opening exposition is filled with life and character. That's without even mentioning the great animation and music, which are a given for any Miyazaki movie. What's interesting is that Miyazaki views this film as a mistake of sorts. The movie's production history is a combination of The Cat Returns and Howl's Moving Castle. This was adapted from a manga Miyazaki created, and it was originally going to be a short film to be exclusively screened in Japan Airlines flights. However, the conflict in Yugoslavia at the time prompted Miyazaki to change his course, give the film a slightly more serious tone, and make it feature length. I can't say it didn't harm the film in any way. It seems to have built up character growth for Porco, yet it doesn't really pay off in the end. Same for many of the other different storylines going on. It all results in an ending that seems jarringly gloomy and disconnected from the rest of the plot. It's not like it doesn't have an impact on the rest of the story because what's the point of build up if it doesn't build up to anything? It makes the rest of the film looks somewhat unsatisfying. It's probably what Miyazaki meant when he said adult film for children, just this weird mesh of tones that don't really click well. Even with its flaws, I still think it's a blast. It's the journey, not a destination in this case, and I think it deserves to be one of Ghibli's more iconic works. Lupin the Third The Castle of Cagliostro is Miyazaki's first feature film. While watching Takahata's debut, it was hard for me to imagine it was the same guy who directed, well, literally any of the other movies he made. That's not the case here. Just like with Perco Rosso, The Castle of Cagliostro is incredibly energetic and fun from beginning to end. It's the type of film that, if I had seen it as a kid, I would constantly watch it over and over and over because it's so much fun. Simple, wacky fun. It's based off of the Lupin the Third anime series, which is in turn based off of a manga by the late Monkey Punch. Miyazaki and Takahata both directed episodes for this highly influential show, and so one of them was chosen for one of the film adaptations. I have never ever consumed a single other piece of Lupin the Third media, but apparently the characterization has been purposefully changed, the main offender being Lupin himself, who's turned from a selfish thief to a gentleman thief. Or as Monkey Punch himself put it, um, 
Okay, this resulted in this film not doing as well financially as the previous loop in the third movie, but thankfully, it has since gained its much-deserved cult following. While it may not nail the character down perfectly, it works wonderfully as a standalone experience. Despite not seeing the show or reading the manga, I understood what Lupin's relationship with these characters was and what kind of role they probably served. Each of these characters is memorable and entertaining, and the interactions between them are creatively bizarre yet charming. The characters newly introduced for this movie aren't too interesting, but their blandness doesn't take away from how well they serve their role in the story. The animation is damn good for something from 1979. Every action scene is appropriately fast-paced and the detailed movements add to the excitement all the more. The titular castle of Cagliostro is a fantastic setting for a caper film. The many traps and contraptions make it so that each scene has a unique threat Lupin has to overcome. Not just dodging a trap or something, but performing a feat of strength, outsmarting a bad guy, or manipulating the environment to his advantage. This variety is what keeps the experience so endlessly entertaining. Many of the set pieces in the film are so memorable and well executed, they directly or indirectly influenced many movies that have come out since. The movie also caught the eye of Toshio Suzuki, which led to his Miyazaki's long partnership and ultimately the creation of the topic of this video. The same applies to John Lasseter, starting a decades-long friendship which also was a big part in making Ghibli as big as it is. I don't know if they're still friends, I sure hope not, but I thought it was an important thing to bring up. There's a ton of conveniences and contrivances, in any other movie I would be annoyed by this, but each strange way Lupin manages to get out of trouble is entertainingly strange, therefore I forgive it. It doesn't really have rules and it's very self-aware in that department. It clearly just does what it needs to have fun and be fun. Miyazaki probably changed Lupin's personality intentionally, in order to make it something more fun and universally appealing. Like Uncharted, but Japanese and for younger audiences. If he didn't have the foresight to do this, aka if he didn't show his talent and imagination right with his first feature right off the bat, we wouldn't have Ghibli at all. Unlike Porco Rosso, this movie never loses its edge or momentum, it never gets confused. Almost every great thing I said about Porco Rosso applies here. So, go watch it, you dum-dums. I was honestly really taken by surprise by Modest Heroes. It's a collection of short films, each playing off the theme of humble everyday hero, or at least what's considered an everyday hero in the universe of these shorts. It's apparently the first installment in what's called the Ponak Short Films Theater. I guess Ponak is planning on making many more of these short film collections like this one, and whenever they do, I'll eat that shit right up. The first short is Kanini and Kanino by Hiromasa Yonobayashi, a director we've seen three times before. There was an artistic decision made to give the characters a very primitive and limited vocabulary, I understand the idea but it gets kind of annoying. This is easily the weakest short of the three, not just because of that, but also the CG. It also doesn't have as much substance as the other two. But it's fine because it has other redeeming qualities. For example, I think the character design is fantastic. It's a simple adventure, it doesn't overstay its welcome, and the actual progression of the story is pretty satisfying for the most part. It actually utilized the small size of the characters for more memorable set pieces than Arietti, and the more I think about it, the more I think it should have been a short. This is easily my favorite of Yonabayashi's directorial works. What makes Modest Heroes special to me is the grouping of these different shorts together. Life Ain't Gonna Lose by Yoshiyuki Momose and Invisible by Akihiko Yamashita are both made by directors with relatively minimal writing and directing experience, unlike Yonabayashi. Despite that, they're better than anything Yonabayashi ever made. Life Ain't Gonna Lose is an amazingly fascinating story about a child with a deadly allergy to eggs. The child and his mother are both incredibly engaging characters. It has legitimately tense moments that made me, an 18-year-old boy, understand what it's like to be a working mother of a kid with a little allergy to something so incredibly common. It uses its characters in conflict to communicate an incredibly impactful message about perseverance. Invisible is a short with minimal dialogue about a man who's both figuratively and literally invisible. It doesn't just hinge on this incredibly basic metaphor, as it is able to communicate so much with so little. The man has no mass, he needs a way to anchor himself to the ground, and that results in beautifully animated and thrilling sequences, and a subtle yet incredibly well communicated message about what it means to be yourself and be a good person. Each short has something important it wants to say, and it has talented people behind it to make that vision really come to life. Even the first short, it's partially based on Yonabayashi's relationship with his wife, so even the weakest
simplest and the simplest short is very personal. I love that we have something which gives us three varied and interesting animated visions in under an hour. Simple and concise, yet varied and deep. Each of these shorts are great experiences on their own and even better together. I do have my issues with it, obviously. The only big issues with any of the shorts are in the first one that I already mentioned, but I have to bring up the opening and transition. The opening song is incredibly annoying and the animation is but ugly. Plus, they use the same stock projector sound effect as the intro for Screen Junkies Honest Trailers. Could you not find a different sound effect? Something incredibly important I have to mention is that Takahata was originally going to direct a fourth short for this anthology, but unfortunately passed away before he had the chance to complete it. It's fascinating to see the different effects Takahata's death made on these different studios. For Ghibli it meant a dear friend and colleague had passed away, yet also it means they have fewer directors they can rely on. His death put them even deeper in the grave they dug for themselves. For Panok, they had lost a dear friend and former colleague, but in terms of creating new art, they weren't affected by it at all, despite being a much younger and lesser known studio. They didn't need him, they already had three other directors they could rely on. All of which, by the way, before working at Panok, were for Ghibli, and already had writing and or directing credits, not just Yonabayashi. They were right under their noses the entire time, implying Ghibli are either incompetent at finding new talent or looking for the wrong thing, which is just another Miyazaki. It's Panak who gave Takahata an opportunity to work again, even though Ghibli came back from their hiatus by that time, further showing their priorities. Instead of adapting to the times and circumstances, they wanted to forcefully preserve their Miyazaki-shaped image for the sake of securing business. They became what people liked them for not being, while the people who left them to do their own thing are keeping their spirit of imagination alive. Panaka became the studio pushing animation talent forward while Ghibli stuck in the past. This is how they ended up with the 2014 closure and Irig and the Witch. It's unfortunate that this film didn't get more recognition. Not only do I think it deserves it way more than weaker films which are more successful, I'd love for Studio Panak to keep moving forward. I want them to make more of these types of anthologies so we'd have a bucket load of unique and imaginative shorts. I absolutely implore you, support Panak and keep an eye on them. Just change the intro next time, please. Hi. So, uh... As you probably noticed, I'm using a different microphone, the one built into my goddamn earbuds because they have no budget. For the next part, it's gonna be entirely this microphone, so I turn the volume up or whatever, whenever that comes out. And speaking of that, don't expect it to come out soon because it's the last part, it's the longest part, and I'm probably also gonna be moving soon, so that's gonna interfere with some stuff. So, to like whatever hardcore fan I may have out there, just uh, a heads up. Okay, bye-bye.